Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to, to the webinar, Rural BC Community Energy and Emissions Decision Support Tools and Approaches. It's great to see the number of people in the audience today. This might be one of our highest uh, attendants uh, in the year and a half that these, uh, these webinars have been, have been happening. So, so welcome, everyone. Um, so the Rural BC webinar series, um, through this series, we hope to provide a link to new information and enable discussion between experts in an affordable, accessible, and sustainable way. And we really hope that that's what happens this afternoon. As Darby mentioned, the webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the Rural BC website. And this allows um, the, the content and, and discussion to be a lasting resources, resource for communities and regions. Um, after the presentations today, when the webinar is, is complete, we'll be seeking your feedback on the session this afternoon, and we'd also like to uh, hear your ideas for future topics as well. So you'll be getting a, uh, a survey uh, in the next day or so. So we've got a packed agenda today, so I'm just going to run through who our presenters are, and then I'm going to pass it over to Ted Sheldon, who will be our, our first presenter, and he's from the Climate Action Secretariat. Alan Harris will be our second speaker, and he's the CAO of the District of Sycamus. Dale Littlejohn is, the, uh, is from the Community Energy Association. Bill Beamish is the CAO in the Village of Queen Charlotte. Yul Hubert is, the, is from the Sustainability Solutions Group. John Gunther is the Director of Planning for the City of Revelstoke. And Tom Slack is from the University of British Columbia. So we'll be starting very shortly um, after, uh, after I'm finished with my introductions. Um, it just, Darby just put the agenda up on the screen. So we have fairly, uh, fairly short presentations, um, about, um, about 15 minutes each. Um, there will be time for questions at the end. Uh, and then we'll close up and we'll have everybody, um, everybody uh, ready to go by 3 o'clock the scheduled end time. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Ted to uh, talk about the objectives for the day. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy. And thanks very much again, though, again to Amy, Darby, and Paige uh, for providing this value venue for profiling uh, some of the range of innovative activities that are going on amongst and across uh, so many BC local governments and their communities across, uh, across the province. This I was just mentally going through my mind. I think this is the fifth, fifth time we've been blessed by uh, by doing uh, by by doing uh, these webinars. Um, both uh, starting off with the community energy mission inventory reports uh, that all local governments now have in BC. The last one over the summer was on uh, community energy and emission modeling, uh, profiling three uh, three uh, communities in BC with that, and then also um, and forthcoming and part of what we're talking about today is in and around uh, some of the experiences. Uh, here on uh, community energy and emissions related uh, related planning, and it was based on the feedback from uh, from the modeling session that we held in early summer, where uh, where some some of the uh, some of the communities, the rural communities, were asking for a more dedicated focus on, on what some of the BC rural communities are doing in and around energy and emissions, or if you will, like climate action related activities. So as such, we have three objectives today, and first and foremost, the primary one is to share some of those experience, experiences that three, uh, three BC rural communities and their uh, practitioners are, have offered to bring to the table. Uh, some of those decision support tools and processes include uh, community energy emissions inventory, modeling and planning. As well, we'll hear a couple of examples, well, more than examples, innovations in their own right, in and around a revolving fund for energy efficiency and, and progressive innovative uh, development bylaw uh, framework and approach within one of the communities. Also, it's the broad, um, broad fabric of stakeholder engagement, and here we will we'll hear, hear speakers touch on uh, engagement with council, with uh, neighboring, uh, neighboring peers in uh, neighboring communities, with the broad public and related particularly to the latter uh, is the visualization work that the University of British Columbia is bringing to the table to support uh, at present the uh, city of Rosso. Second, uh, second objective is to wrap things up so hopefully we'll be able to have, um, we'll have time for questions and discussion, although as, as Amy said, it's a packed agenda, but we're hoping to get through so we can have 15 to 20 minutes of uh, 
uh, for questions and, and uh, related follow-up discussion. And then last but not least, to profile some of the relevant resources, those that have been established and many of you are familiar with already and a couple that are forthcoming. And without belaboring this by too much, uh, particularly if you're uh, within a local government uh, in BC, you're, uh, you're likely to be familiar with, uh, with these two, uh, these two uh, main bullets. One is the Local Government Act and the related uh, 2008 changes uh, to the Local Government Act that A, required uh, the, uh, the establishment of a greenhouse gas target policies and actions in either a municipality's OCP or regional district's regional growth strategy. Uh, complementary to that came a number of enabling tools uh, that uh, were established uh, as part of those changes in the legislation and as well some of the support that in, in, uh, in the following particular case has been uh, spearheaded by the Ministry of uh, Community Sport and Cultural Development who also oversees a number of uh, climate action sustainability related initiatives including the updates to the Local Government Act and that is in a recently posted document uh, entitled the Development Permanent Areas Guide for Climate Action. Third on that soap is the annual tariff reports, which is a requirement for local governments to, uh, to submit annual reports and providing updates on their progress towards uh, and or development of uh, greenhouse gas uh, targets, policies, and actions. And, uh, and again, that has just recently been, uh, been posted for all to see, and we'll touch base on that on the last slide. Second bullet here is the Climate Action Target 79 of uh, BC's uh, local governments, certainly by, by far the majority. Have, uh, have become uh, voluntary signatories to the Climate Action Charter and the three commitments within that charter you see listed here. Of particular note is the third one, which is create, compact, complete, more energy efficient rural and urban communities. And of course, the, some of the tools that local governments have uh, in their uh, in their toolkit around land use zoning, around uh, engaging with other stakeholders and others will assist them in, uh, in progressively working towards achieving that commitment. So without further ado, my last slide, leading the segue into our three pairs of presenters, is uh, first off to very sincerely welcome them for putting in the time and effort leading up to and, uh, and at this uh, webinar, uh, both the three uh, community representatives themselves and their support practitioners. So first off will be Alan Harris from the District of uh, Sycamus and Dale Littlejohn from the Community Energy Association, and they'll share how the district's use of BC Hydro CEP Quick Start Program has been directly contributing to the development of Sigamoose's community energy and emissions plan. Second pairing is, is uh, we're honored to have Bill Beavis from the village of Queen Charlotte and Yul Hibbert from the Sustainability Solutions Group, and they will profile the use of the GHG proof modeling tool along with Bill's collaborative work with colleagues and neighborhood municipalities, and they together were instrumental in creating a climate action plan for the communities of Queen Charlotte, Massif, and Port Clements as well as an innovative energy efficiency revolving fund that, uh, that uh, you will touch on for us. And then last pairing is John Gunther from the city of Revelstoke, compared uh, not only presentation-wise, but in the same room with Ron Kellett from the University of British Columbia. And they'll provide us with a glimpse of how UBC's emerging work on community-based visualizations will strengthen the efforts of an already forward-thinking local government in its ability to engage its residents as we're able to integrate energy and emissions considerations into its longer range plans and development bylaws. Both, uh, or you, you will hear from the speakers, uh, both not only climate action successes to date, but also the challenges that rural communities have in, uh, in moving forward on climate, uh, local, uh, local Government Act and Climate Action Charter commitments. So first, Alan from District of Sycamore is going to kick things off. Alan? Great, Alan, and I'm just going to switch things over. Alan, are you able to unmute with star six? Perhaps not. Could you actually try star nine, please? And I know some people do press the, the pound nine instead of it's actually the star nine. Don't seem to be able to hear you yet. We did uh, test this yesterday and we're able to make it work for us, but there seemed to be some trouble. So what I'm going to do is actually take the meeting off of lecture mode. So what I'm going to ask is all attendees to please uh, mute their line now. So star six, if you could all press star six, and then hopefully we'll be able to hear Alan here. So the conference is no longer in lecture mode. So can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Go ahead. There we go as I fade into the picture. 
All right. Uh, so, uh, uh, my web. The bottom left hand corner. Up. Up. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, so basically, uh, my name is Alan Harrison, the CAO for the District of Sycamus, um, and Dale Littlejohn has also helped us out on this. And basically, what Ted asked uh, me to do was to uh, next slide. It's not coming through. You there, Alan? Darby, oh, there we go. Yeah, so it's those arrows in the bottom left-hand corner um, should help you advance things. Just above the uh, the start button. I can help you move along too if you need. There you go. Ah, there we go. Uh, yeah. Okay. So technical as always. Where did uh, where did it start for Sycamus? Uh, uh, basically, and um, it, it looks like the first part. This worked in uh, our test run. It's not working now. But in 2007, the district supported the Climate Action Charter, uh, but did not sign it. Uh, the reason was council was concerned and staff were concerned in regards to the amount of resources that would uh, we would uh, have to put forward to that and the costs involved. In 2008, with the introduction of the Bill 27, the changes to the Local Government Act, uh, council signed the charter, and it, that was very unique in the sense that uh, uh, they were able to um, um, get a, a $6 million grant. Um, and that started the journey toward the Community Energy Emissions Plan, or SEEP, as it's known. Um, there we go. May of 2009, the district adopted its new official community plan, which included a number of GHG policies, but not specific targets. Uh, at the time, the uh, the consultants had included them. Uh, there was discussions with the community, and we got some responses on that. Uh, in June of 2009, uh, staff was introduced to the provincial community energy and emissions inventory calculations being done for all local governments. And uh, the question was, does the district, you know, hire a consultant, or uh, or do we use staff to determine the targets? Um, in May 2010, the answer basically was that the district went with using the provincial CEE calculations, even though there's some a little bit of flaws for the district of Sycamus in the sense that we don't have natural gas, there's a lot of propane and uh, also um, wood and oil, so we have to estimate those calculations. Uh, and we use the, uh, as opposed to using the provincial targets, we use the FPM uh, PCP aspirational targets which was basically 6% by 2017, and we would be reviewing it in 2014 with uh, the OCP review. Um, now the fun part, coming up with a plan. Now, unlike uh, becoming carbon neutral at the corporate level, reducing the overall community em emissions presents a unique challenge. And basically, in Sycamore, that's changing the habits and the views of individuals. Now, the biggest habit is uh, gasoline. Uh, use and the price of. And then the other one is that there are some naysayers uh, in regards to uh, is there really global warming, similar to the Wild Rose Party of Alberta. Um, so in, in regards to in February 2010, uh, staff attended the Young Anderson planning seminar, Green Tools for Large Scale Development were discussed. And it came up with uh, a lot of tools, potential tools, to deal with uh, reducing the emissions from buildings, uh, solar, electric heating, cooling, uh, biogas, biosolid, ground source heat, and so forth. Um, and and this, this was important because uh, Sycamus is, has been striving to become a uh, resort yes. tour, uh, tourism destination. So the, the Sorry, Alan, uh, just uh, our attendees, if you could please hit star six to mute your line, and uh, we'd greatly appreciate that. Sorry, Alan, go ahead. Oh, no, that's all right. So the question became, how, you know, how do we develop uh, without increasing uh, GHG and reducing it at the same time? So basically what uh, uh, what staff did was, uh, or council did, was lead by example. The new district hall uh, has... Uh, you know, was should be lead silver gold. We had waste diversion. We also went with a geothermal uh, system instead of propane. Again, we don't have natural gas. And what we also did was we provided 
three electric outlets for uh, cars for public use. Uh, we hope to have them uh, 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 powered by a um, uh, wind uh, off the top of the roof. We're, we're just checking into that uh, to make sure that we have the eight kilometer, five mile an hour speed limit that we need to get. Um, However, the, the main GHE contributing segments is not buildings, but on-road transportation. So when you look at where we are in regards to segments overall, you will see that a lot of it has to do with vehicles. Uh, so segments, uh has been, over the years, looking at an active transportation system, improving cycling and walking opportunities, and looking into getting a transit uh, system, rural transit system, uh, within segments and from Sycamus to Salmon Arm or Sycamus to Vernon. Um, then we preparing to develop for this, uh, to come up with a community uh, emissions plan, uh, attended a couple of webinars, reviewed a lot of other plans. Um, we identified, staff identified a number of tools and actions that could be included. Um, and, and how to calculate was really, was a, uh, my basic concern is, are the tools we choosing the correct tools? Um, and that led to uh, BC Hydro's uh, seat quick start. Um, was that LGMA conference uh, this past year, and uh, I have to say that Chastity, uh, who put it from BC Hydro, she did an awesome job, um, and basically looked at a usable tool to establish an energy plan. Um, it also gave us the opportunity to to see if we were heading in the right direction. And and also, it was a great tool for uh, getting council on side. Uh, in August 2011, we held a workshop. Uh, uh, BC Hydro community, uh, Dale was there. Uh, also, Ted uh, was there. Um, and currently, what we're working on is, I'm in the process of finalizing the SEEP. Uh, and, and out of the process, and, and I have to thank Dale, um, we entered into a memorandum of understanding with uh, three other communities are involved in it with UBC in regards to a potential biomass energy system, uh, which will be hopefully a job creation, include the First Nations, and reduce the fire risk around uh, sickness. So right now, I'd like to pass it on to Dale. Well, thank you uh, <coughs> very much, Alan. And uh, just, uh, Darby, if I could get you to confirm that uh, you can hear me? Absolutely, I can. And, and I'd just also like to note, unfortunately, we don't have Dale's uh, video camera, so uh, uh, it looks like you'll be looking at me and hearing Dale, I'm afraid. <laughs> Go ahead, Dale. Yes, uh, yeah, I'm with Community Energy Association, Executive Director there, and we're a small NGO, and uh, Ted has promised uh, to arrange a grant for us to uh, get a webcam uh, at some point, right, Ted? Uh, <laughs> well, we're working on it right now. Uh, <laughs> no, thanks a lot, and um, and Alan, uh, it's great to great to see the uh, overview of uh, the and that. Uh, with the last item that I mentioned, I should uh, mention with the uh, biomass. That's the uh, innovative uh, project between UBC uh, Collaborative for Advanced Landscape Planning, Green Heat Initiative, and the. Uh, with a number of small communities. Um, the <coughs> Community Energy Association is the delivery agent for the DC Hydro SEEP Community Energy Emission Planning Quick Start process. This is delivered for free to municipalities under 20,000 population in hydro territory across DC. And uh, you can sign up online. Uh, we have a overview of the registration process. There are some documents that you need to upload to uh, the online registration system. There are some pre-workshop reading, including uh, a guide, an action guide for municipalities on uh, community actions, as well as a webinar. Then we go in for a day and a half with staff and council and produce a draft report. Um, and then it's moving on rapidly to implementation. This program is designed really to come to uh, very specific practical actions quickly. And uh, recognizing that it is being delivered to uh, smaller communities, we have to deliver it in a cost-effective way. And so we bring in a number of tools to help uh, move the process along a little bit quicker. 
We have a really big spreadsheet that uh, pulls in the Canadian Energy and Mission Inventory data that uh, Ted and his colleagues uh, have uh, put together for each uh, jurisdiction in BC. Uh, there are 40 or so very specific actions along with descriptions and approaches to quantifying or uh, getting close to quantifying the uh, impacts likely from those. So we come in with a standard process, but very unique content. We've done this with a variety of communities, and the content is always somewhat different. One of the things that we also include in this is the economic development component. We make some uh, estimates of total energy spend. Uh, for Sycamus, it looked like uh, a little bit over $9 million uh, energy spend um, with a population of uh, just under 3,000. So. One of the things that we look at is if some of that uh, energy spend can be uh, managed locally, if that can be recirculated in the community, would that have an economic development benefit to it? And on the next slide, uh, as I mentioned, we've uh, done this in a number of uh, pilot communities uh, who were uh, really uh, basically uh, the guinea pigs uh, for this, and we learned a lot and have uh, evolved the program a bit from that. But many thanks to uh, the uh, pilot communities who uh, signed up and uh, went through this program initially. We've also uh, delivered the full program, uh, started to roll it out uh, earlier this year, and I think our next ones are Lake Country and Taylor. Some of the lessons learned, we recognize that we need to produce a uh, report uh, after uh, the first day before the uh, second day to help uh, the staff uh, move that forward uh, more quickly. We can produce a report fairly quickly based on uh, uh, templates and that, uh, and again, unique content. Uh, what we find, too, is particularly in the afternoon of the second day, we go through some detailed math regarding some of the actions, the priority actions, and that's really where some of the epiphanies happen in its country when you actually start calculating what could we really get out of this. That's where there's surprises about, oh, we, we thought that would be more or less. And we, on the second day particularly, we work through uh, what we actually have to do to make these actions happen. We are, uh, we do have an agreement from BC Transit for them to uh, do their best to show up at each one of these quick starts because in, I think, every one that we've done, um, transportation has, uh, particularly in our community transportation, as well as BC Transit, have uh, been, uh, been a topic of discussions. Uh, the other thing that we've uh, <coughs> found and uh, tweaked slightly in the program is we really try to get to actions uh, as soon as possible, so more about the what rather than the why, uh, because we when we do that, we see that there's a lot less resistance from those folks who don't like uh, climate change. When you look at the specific actions to do, there's uh, there's not that much to uh, really argue with. And the bottom line is get started now. Uh, it doesn't have to be the perfect plan, but get something out there that you're uh, that you're going to be able to implement that recognizes uh, staff constraints. As I mentioned, we come in with certain tools. We go through a process uh, with uh, with a number of action cards based on the action guide and some really detailed discussion in a group environment around what we want to do. Then we plan that out, looking over a number of years, and then we get into quantification and uh, some of the to-dos around specific actions. So that's uh, that's pretty much a brief overview of the Seed Quick Start program. Whoops. And thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dale. And uh, we do have a question here that uh, Ted Sheldon did want to take at this uh, at this time. So thanks again, Dale. Ted, go ahead. Yeah, Alan and Dale, thank you very much. Awesome. And uh, a good uh, overview of uh, some of the dynamic things going on with this thing of us, let alone the, uh, the application of the CEP Quick Start. I'm just, uh, I see Anne, uh, you have a question, District of McKenzie, if I can read it out here. Will there be changes to the DEI report currently? There does uh, currently uh, doesn't report on emissions for large corporations. If one corporation has the most emissions, privacy concerns. Uh, we have large, uh, uh, without name numbers, we have large mills and have uh, and have no information on emissions. Uh, a couple of dynamics coming up, but uh, we're just on time here, so I'll be brief. And I can certainly follow it up during the discussion period or, or offline. But yes, we 
are working with the utility on, uh, on looking at a different threshold from what is presently a 50% threshold uh, to a less than number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, residential, commercial, and, uh, and industrial. So we're going through that process as we speak, and part of that is embroiled in a, in a CEI complementary initiative called Tandem, which is Track and Neighborhood Data Modeling. So I'd be glad to uh, share that uh, with you in, in more detail. So but suffice it to say that for any subsequent reports uh, come, that may come up and still have uh, information, primarily at the industrial level, that is withheld for really competitive rights reasons, that uh, we encourage uh, discussions with us and the utility who are really just protecting it on behalf of their clients. And we, and we have had occasion where we then work with the, uh, with the client and that, uh, and that facility, uh, the utility and that facility, and they have uh, had, uh, where they have no concerns with that, then we make it available and update the CEI report. So hopefully that helps for now. Great. Thank you. Good. Thanks for the question and thanks, Ted. Um, we do have another uh, question there, but I think we, we do need to go on with the next uh, presentation here. But we do still invite your questions, and we'll certainly get to that one yet. Um, but before Bill does start, um, I, I did do just want to mention that uh, Bill is uh, um, in a rural community, and uh, that there are some bands with uh, challenges, perhaps with the video. So it may be a bit blotchy. We may even lose his video, but we can hear him fine. Go ahead, Bill. You can hear him fine. Yeah. I go. <laughs> Good afternoon, and uh, I'm not on mute, I assume. We can hear you fine. Okay, uh, with Village of Queen Charlotte, I'm the CAO, and I'll be joined here by Yul Herbert, the Director for Sustainability Solutions Group, at the back end of this presentation. So, And this is a view of how the sun comes up every morning in Queen Charlotte, of course. <laughs> Queen Charlotte is located in Haida Gwaii, the traditional territory of the Haida Nation, and uh, many of the things that we do on Haida Gwaii are closely related to the Council of Haida Nations and our neighboring community here of Skidigat, and then Old Masset, uh, which is at the north end of the island. Um, we are within the Queen Charlotte, uh, rather the Skeena Queen Charlotte Regional District, which is actually headquartered out of Prince Rupert. The total population of Haida Gwaii is approximately 5,000 people, and there are five main communities, with Masset being the largest. Uh, Port Clements, Queen Charlotte, and the Haida communities of Old Masses and Skidigat. Sandspit is the largest of the rural communities, and it's located on uh, Moresby Island, uh, right across the, the bay from us here. Uh, our main links uh, to the BC mainland is by BC ferries, and that's for food, supplies, access to medical specialists, school supports, uh, events. Um, it's six hours one way uh, on those days when the ferry is running. Uh, ferry is very weather uh, uh, dependent, so um, with, if it's extra windy, uh, the ferry will not come. And if that happens on a Monday, we don't get the grocery order. We also have two airports with connections to Vancouver, approximately two hours away. And uh, Massa is 115 kilometers from Queen Charlotte along Highway 16. Uh, some of the challenges that uh, we, like other remote uh, rural communities, experience is one is the remoteness, uh, access to services, uh, our transportation services, and, and high costs, uh, resulting in a high cost of food and materials. We have a small population base, as I mentioned, of 5,000 people. Uh, we have a lot of very independent and environmentally aware thinkers on the island. Uh, the remoteness, I think, is what attracts them to be here. Um, Energy-wise, our electricity here is uh, diesel-generated for the most part, 100% uh, on the north end of the island from Masset and Port Clements and Old Masset. Uh, on the south end of the island, uh, we have diesel-generated and a small hydro project operated by EPCOR, and that's over on Moresby Island. Uh, tremendous lack of government capacity for major projects. Uh, we deal with off-island bureaucracies uh, for a lot of our programs, and we're very dependent upon grants for projects having a small tax base that we all have here. Um, high cost of fuel is one thing we contend with daily. Uh, this slide, November 11th, the price of gas and diesel were $1.66 and $1.57 per liter, liter respectively, and there's no, there's no extra taxes included in that. That's just what we deal with on a daily basis. Our Climate Action Plan was completed in 2011 by the Sustainability Solutions Group. Uh, that plan is on our website if you're interested in seeing it. 
the plan was jointly funded by a BC planning grant uh, for $10,000 and the balance shared equally by Massett, Fort Clements, and Queen Charlotte. Uh, what we discovered um, about late in the fall last year, we got an email actually from the province asking if we we're going to uh, submit a claim on a, a planning grant that we actually didn't realize that we had. Uh, so we looked at it and um, uh, at our quarterly uh, managers meeting on the island here with the other communities, uh, we raised the issue of whether they wanted to participate with us uh, on a climate action plan. They did uh, uh, very quickly, got their council support. Uh, Sustainability Solutions Group already had an associate on Haida Gwaii, which made it very easy for us to connect with them. And uh, they came on board and uh, completed the plan over approximately a three-month period. The plan does not include uh, the regional district or any of the regional areas or the Haida communities. We are dealing with the Council of Haida Nation now on some follow-up from the plan and very hopefully going to be having a meeting with them in the next few weeks. Um, Queen Charlotte Council adopted the plan and has incorporated it into a new OCP which is adopted in June of this year. Um, highlights of the plan. It, uh, the plan highlighted that uh, the nature of our communities, we have compact communities with a higher average proportion of cycling and walking rates than the provincial average. Um, an opportunity to develop a revolving loan fund versus the purchase of carbon offsets, and Yule will get into discussion of that at the end of the presentation. Um, it provided a municipal, identified municipal partnership and opportunities beyond just the development of the plan, and primarily on the energy and transportation issues. Uh, all communities need clean energy, electrical energy versus the existing diesel generation on Haida Gwaii. Uh, community economic development opportunities exist for development of clean energy options, and specific options were developed uh, for each community situation, and they were included in the plans. For Queen Charlotte, um, specifically, uh, our 2020 targets uh, that have been adopted into our official community plan now are to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 20% over 2007 levels, to reduce solid waste production by 50%, to reduce liquid waste production by 50% and to produce 26% of our food requirements locally. And the food requirement, of course, is important because everything that we have here is generally imported. Uh, although we're getting better, we have a couple of agricultural operations going on, on the island uh, and they are increasing. Um, some of the actions that we looked at, again, the establishing a revolving energy loan fund, developing an island-wide transportation strategy, develop renewable energy through utility and household scale generation, develop a district energy system. In Queen Charlotte, for example, we have on the, on the books, on the plans, a $50 million uh, new hospital, and there's uh, opportunities perhaps to link that hospital uh, to our commercial sector of the town uh, for a district energy system at that level. Developing a composting system and encouraging recycling and, of course, supporting low-flow toilets, composting toilets, and other water conservation measures. One of the things that uh, Queen Charlotte doesn't yet have, being a new community, is a, um, is a lot of bylaws. Uh, we don't, for example, have zoning. Uh, we don't have a building code, building bylaw. Uh, so we, at this point in time, don't have a lot of opportunity to go within people's property lines to uh, deal with issues that uh, they have there. They are responsible, of course, to to comply with the BC building codes, which now has a low flow toilet requirement in it. But we're progressing and we are actually having adopted an official community plan this year. We are looking as a next step to develop a zoning bylaw. This is an example of one of the tables of the, the plan that just shows you uh, what the impact of the uh, diesel generated electricity is. Um, the Queen Charlotte BC emissions factor of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, 52 tons. The offset cost for Queen Charlotte at this time is uh, $1,316. Uh, soon to increase as we take over the fire department uh, building um, later next, early next year. Um, based on the uh, north-south grid emissions factor though on diesel, uh, use of diesel energy, that uh, tonnage jumps up to 135 tons for a $3,383 offset cost. 
And uh, you can see, though, the dramatic difference that makes in NASA, where they are 100% electric, electrical generated by diesel, uh, where the, the diesel offset cost is 26000 versus 4000 using the BC rate of $25 a ton. So we have some issues. We have some opportunities uh, to improve uh, situations here on Hyatt Y, definitely. Uh, this is a table out of the, um, now in our OCP, but also in our plan. And this shows some of the strategies uh, that we're looking at, um, some of the themes of transportation, buildings, waste, air quality, some of the actions that we're looking at, environmental benefits, social benefits, and economic benefits. And for example, on transportation, great walking cycling path, uh, Council has already implemented that. We are currently developing a 1.5 kilometer seawalk uh, from a grant that we received in uh, July of this year. Uh, we're also looking at opening some of our uh, undeveloped rights away for connectivity within the municipality, building stairs and improving the... Uh, all right, Bill, I am going to interrupt here. If I could just ask uh, our attendees to please uh, mute, their, uh, mute their line. Star six, please. And I think someone's on hold. I think someone may be on hold. Sorry, Bill, we may have to... You could beat out that the music, please. Background music to my presentation. Let me just try one more thing. Try and go on lecture mode, Bill, and then... I'll... One moment. The conference is in lecture mode. Okay, Bill, hopefully this works for you. Can you hit star nine, please? Now, unfortunately, we don't seem to be able to hear you again. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take off lecture mode. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. And there, Bill. Can I'm here. You Go ahead. Okay. All right, so these are some of the things that we are looking at. Uh, as I say, we've incorporated this table into our official community plan, and uh, and we will be working through some of these strategies uh, over the course of the next few years. One of the opportunities, of course, in, in, in the timing of the project that we did, the consultation with the community that was able to be held in concert with the consultation on the official community plan and the public hearing that's required. So, so we were able to incorporate uh, the consultation on the um, energy plan at the same time and ensure that all of the community became aware of it. Um, some of the conclusions at this point in time, uh, small communities, of course, have limited resources and capacity to undertake planning and implementation. Uh, grants are important. Partnerships are important in rural communities with neighboring communities, government agencies, and with First Nations. Uh, plans must be realistic and achievable. And GHG offset costs should be remaining in the community or regions and be available to develop alternatives and to encourage programs that reduce GHGs. Uh, we do have uh, alternative energy activity going on, on the island. This is a uh, set of solar panels that's on a house uh, nearby our office here. And uh, this particular house is charged, trickle charging into batteries and they do not notice the uh, frequent times that uh, we have brownouts or power outages due, due to uh, windstorms. Um, this is one of our ISP providers on the island, and this is one of his, uh, his towers, uh, communications towers, and again, uh, backed up with the solar panels for his batteries. He actually has a windmill at the top of that pole we see there. Uh, this is a larger windmill operation, uh, private operation up in North Beach. And this is a uh, micro hydro operation on the Mott Island farm, which actually produces a good deal of the uh, uh, agricultural produce that we purchase uh, uh, week on the weekends here at the uh, farmer's market. Uh, this slide here is just to demonstrate that it's not all bad. Uh, this picture was taken on Christmas Day last year uh, for the Christmas uh, kayak get-together, and uh, remoteness does have its benefits. I'll turn it over to you all now to carry on. And maybe if you can click me through. Sure, absolutely. I just would ask uh, our attendees, please not to put their uh, phone on hold um, during the presentation. And if you, again, we did have a little bit of feedback. If you could uh, mute your line, star six to mute your line. Thanks very much. Sorry, you will. Go ahead. Thank you. So I just wanted to start by saying that um, Haida Gwaii is one of the best places that I've ever got to work. 
was the only time that the first thing that happened to me when I arrived was that I got taken out for a, a four-hour kayak ride with the the, lo the local CAO of the community. <laughs> So um, this is a list of the communities that we've been working with over the past six or seven years to model greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we've worked with a lot of small and medium-sized and larger-sized communities to look at their greenhouse gas emissions. And each exercise has been different in terms of the depth of the analysis and the types of scenarios that were developed. Um, so in terms of some of the observations that we've found in this process is that the first one is that um, the modeling indicates that the 33% by 2020 target that many municipalities have adopted is extremely ambitious and requires a fundamental change in the design of communities. There's no way that, uh, at least in my opinion, that a community can expect to keep on going with status quo and achieve those types of targets. Um, so this target in particular, and even less ambitious targets, have fundamental implications for the way in which BC communities function. But change can really be an opportunity, and that's where we've been focusing. We've, in our modeling, we've identified three key challenges for rural communities. Um, this one is communities with flat or declining populations have much fewer levers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because there's simply little change in those communities. The second challenge is that there's limited engagement by community members because there are often competing priorities. Some communities, particularly resource communities, are facing significant economic challenges. The population may be aging, or there just aren't that many people. And so it's difficult to engage, um, to find a critical mass of people who will support, become the constituency for climate action. The third challenge is that carving out staff time and finding financial resources in very tight budgets with a small staff that often already has way too much on its plate is extremely difficult. And um, Haida Gwaii, communities would be a great example of that. Um, so this is a map of the village of Masson on Haida Gwaii, which, like all the communities on Haida Gwaii, are very compact, and they have a very high walking mode share as a result. Um, SSG's focus, one of the solutions to some of the challenges I presented, is really to look at land use and to implement as, much, as many possible solutions at the land use level. Land use is the foundation on which all GHG strategies must start, and everything flows from land use. If you have a compact, mixed-use community, it is easier for people to walk or cycle instead of drive. District energy and public transit become economically feasible, and there are many other health and community benefits. If it's not compact, these strategies are expensive and complicated. For those communities with a flat or declining population, like those in Haida Gwaii, it appears difficult to alter the existing land use pattern of the community, but there are always potential interventions because there is always change. For example, in Hope, one of the potential land use interventions was to incentivize setting up a grocery store so that people wouldn't need to drive to Chilliwack. Or in the village of Queen Charlotte, the municipality might work with local community groups to support affordable housing near a commercial development, enabling people to walk to work and helping to focus development in the center of the community. The second strategy that we've been using for small and, and actually for all the municipalities we've worked with, worked with is to broaden the scope of the analysis. So our approach has been, been to consider the variables that a municipality can influence, all the variables that a municipality can influence in its efforts to reduce GHG emissions. For example, a municipality can influence the number of trees or even apply it for a community forest, thus increasing its carbon sink and reducing its emissions. A municipality can also influence how much land is used for agriculture and whether the food produced is locally consumed by encouraging farmers markets or box programs. GHG emissions associated with non-local food are very high, so this is a, an additional leverage point that can be used. The third point I will mention is that we look for synergies, and this has already been touched on in a couple of presentations so far, but opportunities to do things that will not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also <coughs> other community priorities. So, for example, in the village of Queen Charlotte, many people walk along the main road, including tourists who admire the beautiful view. And the introduction of a foot or bicycle path, which has now been done or is in process, will be a tourist draw, increasing the safety of pedestrians and reducing greenhouse gas emissions as more people feel secure in cycling and walking. So it is a win-win-win solution. In addition, we seek to frame the strategy around issues which resonate locally on high energy security, 
is a major issue there, both in terms of cost and reliability. One of the most interesting ideas that emerged out of Haida Gwaii is the Revolving Loan Fund proposal. This fund would leverage carbon offset money from the municipalities with other funds from local foundations, BC Hydro, and other sources. The fund would make loans which reduce household and business energy costs in the community. Then the cost savings would be split between paying back the loan to the fund and the homeowner or business owner. So both the business or homeowner gain as and the fund gets the money paid back from savings. And in order for the fund to meet the spirit of the climate action, investments need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to those produced by the municipality's operations. And the reductions must occur outside of the corporate operations. So for that fund to meet that, that charter, it has to uh, reduce GHG emissions equal to what the corporate emissions are. And it must also happen outside of the scope of the corporate operations. And so the last thing we do in terms of identifying synergies is, is always to translate the GHG target into household cost saved. So, for example, if, if the target um, reduces a certain amount of greenhouse gas emissions, we'll say, well, that's going to reduce the average household energy cost by $2,500 from transportation and household energy. And this is something that resonates a lot with people a lot more easily than tons of greenhouse gas emissions per capita. And that's it for me. Covered that one already. Covered that one. Here. Thank you. And over. And if I can just, uh, just pop again, just, just uh, coming over to, to uh, Ron and, and John. And just thank you very much, Bill and uh, and Ewell, and some of the candid thoughts in and around some of the challenges of rural communities, as well as uh, as well as some of the opportunities. You saw credits in terms of contacts. We'll be we'll be revisiting them for the whole list of uh, contacts from our valued speakers here at the end, as well as a couple of other points. But, uh, and we're a little bit behind, so we won't address any, any questions now, but as Darby says, please, as they come up in your mind, send them into, uh, into the webinar here, and we'll address them uh, afterwards. And without further ado, we have the dynamic duo of uh, John Gunther and, uh, and Ron Gillette coming from, a, uh, from the University of uh, British Columbia together. John from the uh, city of Revelstoke. Thank you very much, Ted. I hope you can hear me. And if you can't, let me know. We can. Uh, go ahead. You cannot hear me? We can. Go, go ahead, John. Okay. So uh, what I'd like to do is start off, hopefully you can see this pointer here with the uh, general description of the city itself. Uh, the city is about 8,000 people, permanent residents, a little less than that. Uh, we have a fairly large resort on the southeast corner here, uh, which is a world-class ski resort. Uh, a lot of construction is going on there right now, uh, and the mountain is, of course, open and active, open this weekend, as a matter of fact. Uh, we have a large, a fairly significant downtown uh, core, uh, and that core itself is uh, is pretty central to the infrastructure. We have adopted an OCP in uh, 2009, and as part of that OCP objective, Council has seen that we should be putting together a fairly robust public participation master plan um, one of the objectives within the uh, OCP was, a master, was, master, was the master planning objectives, and that is that we should focus on putting projects together in terms of proactive planning rather than reactive planning. In order to get there, we really thought the decision-making process within the community uh, needs to be embedded within the communities themselves. And to get to that point, uh, we thought the best approach uh, to approach the community was to think in terms of what that fabric looks like, what the forms look like, what the form itself, uh, how it's framed. And so we took on what's called the SMART code. Uh, it's a, an open source code. All of this, is, by the way, is available through our website. Uh, and the, uh, the idea is that the SMART code template itself starts to frame the form and shape of the building, the fabric, the appearance of the community itself, and how it engages the public realm, the public realm being the streets uh, and uh, road network and public spaces. This is a T1 zone, as you can see, it's very natural, open. There's a visual that would appear in the bylaw, and this is what we're working on right now. That T1 zone um, is is uh, available uh, it, for people to take a look at. It's actually one of those things that most rural and, and urban municipalities would be putting into their zoning, uh, and it helps to frame in terms of protected areas. This is a, a shot uh, looking at the Columbia River, uh, and this would be an area, of course, that we would want to protect as opposed to the areas that are in behind here, which is the downtown core. Um, 
One of the interesting statistics here about uh, good comprehensive planning, and you all mentioned this earlier, was land use impacts and greenhouse gas. Uh, it's estimated that Calgary, which has got a, a kind of a 75% sprawling city and maybe a, a 25% uh, compact of other mixed use, will save over $11.2 billion in 60 years if they build compact, a 33% saving on infrastructure. So one of the things we've looked at in terms of uh, impact is that it what's called fiscal impact analysis, and that is what are the costs of building uh, residential development, the cost of streets and infrastructure, and how does that impact the, the urban fabric and the cost of uh, energy itself? Uh, and in most cases, every time a fiscal impact analysis is done, residential single-family development, especially those that are ex exclusively zoned, uh, not that we won't have some of those, cost more in, tax in uh, infrastructure than they pay in taxes. Uh, U.S. EPA study estimates infrastructure 32% to 47% less expensive to build compact. There's another example of what it means to build uh, in more mixed-use components. Doubling residential density will have increasing nearby employment trends and mixed use can decrease vehicle miles traveled by 25%. Uh, it was mentioned earlier by Alan that transportation is a big component of that, but I would bet that most of that transportation efficiency really comes from uh, well thought out land use. In order to look at land use, one of the key parts of this is what's called Euclidean zoning, which is on the left, uh, this area here. This small area, which is outlined by this infrastructure here is separated by uh, a barrier and there's the residential development. In order to go from here to here, it requires a 10 minute drive when you could probably walk for five minutes to three or four minutes. As opposed to the one on the right, which is more of a forms based look, uh, this is not, this is, some of this is back to the future. It's not talking about doing something significantly different than what we've done in the past. We thought about uh, communities much more integrated before the automobile came along. Um, the part of this change is, is taking a look at this. This is a pretty sterile, we believe, hopefully nobody recognizes where this is, uh, a sterile look of a, of a city, a streetscape, no uh, planting, very poor kind of auto-oriented development, uh, what we would call strip mall type of look. And as change occurs, uh, there's the ability to start thinking in terms of more street character of the building and how it engages the street. Uh, and then filling that in with landscaping material and softening uh, the impacts of uh, the asphalt presence and making it much more walkable, much more open. Most people would say this gives the city identity. This is where people want to be. This is the space that people want to occupy uh, as opposed to the, uh, the first slide. So in order to do this, what we've done is taken a formal approach uh, and an informal one. The first one was to take a look, we did a community energy and emissions plan as well, one of the larger ones, even though we're a small city, uh, and the hydro. The objective was to get our targets, uh, fairly realistic ones, lined up with where we, our biggest impacts were, transportation and, um, and, and land use. There is another one with industry, obviously, that impacts a lot of uh, cities as well, which is an important component. So in order to do that, we've, we've drafted the seat, uh, and we have a district energy as well. District energy plan deals with the biomass, and the city has a biomass system. Uh, that's important for us as well, because that has impact on climate change. We, the OCP talks about forms-based bylaw, and that is putting together an integrated bylaw of all uh, development codes. So we're, well, we're hoping to integrate subdivision and everything together. So we deal with the public realm and the private realm together. Part of that process is, called, is the decision-making model that we've talked about. Uh, here's the, the plans working together, both from a community planning perspective and energy planning. We have a website, uh, and this I'm sure Ted will provide the linkages for that, rebelstokeudb.com, which is our planning website, uh, which gives you some linkages on that. Here's our district energy system, uh, which feeds uh, a number of buildings in town. Uh, it, uh, the pipes there are all hot water. Uh, the biomass system is through heat exchangers that are down by the mill. Uh, and it's owned by the city. The city, and this is interesting, some of the questions we ask as far as public engagement is concerned uh, and the involvement of the city and public in those decision-making models. I, we didn't intend anybody to read this slide necessarily, but just to see what the model looks like. Our public participation process, uh, we, a council really wants to engage the community at the grassroots level. It's very important that that engagement be 
uh, active and be responsive to uh, the needs of the community itself and deliver uh, projects and changes that people really understand and can buy into. So we saw this, the left side is being the informal process, the central one is the formal process, that's rezonings, uh, OCP amendments, development review, and then the educational portion, which we hope to integrate uh, working with UBC uh, in, in the community itself. Um, this is so my slide. We're still going on. Oh, you're done. Uh, so I'm done. I'm passing it over to Ron now because I want to see the show. Over to Ron Kellett. So I have to ask a question, Darby. Um, I can be close to the computer or I can be close to the phone. So the question is, can people hear me sufficiently? Well, we can both see you and hear you well. So it looks like you're, you're just right there. All right. Thank you very much. So thanks, John and others. Um, what I uh, would like to do is just recalibrate our conversation just a little bit. We're, we're a, um, a research group in a school of architecture and landscape architecture. And the work that we do um, tries to integrate consideration of environmental issues, energy and emissions chief among them, into planning processes. So the question that we carry around with us uh, most days is this one, which is would local planning be different if people could see energy emissions and emissions in the options that are presented to them? And if that was the case, would their engagement in that seeing uh, help them understand what the implications of those options might be and would that understanding uh, encourage them to accept uh, planning options that were more favorable to energy and emissions than, uh, than perhaps other ones. So the, we were very fortunate last year to get a uh, project grant, a research grant from PIC, Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. Uh, and in that, we partnered with the city of Revelstoke to use a technique that we've applied in uh, many other kinds of communities for other kinds of questions, which we call measured visualizations, uh, to begin to do the public engagement piece around that research question. So if we were to uh, help uh, people in a community um, become interactive with the sorts of studies that link community planning options to energy and emissions, would it respond favorably to the question that we have? So the, perhaps to kind of be mindful of the fact we just started this, so the project was approved uh, in around May. We started in the summer and will run for another year and a few months. So uh, we're kind of in that point where we generally know what we're doing, but we haven't done most of it yet. But I'll let you know what we're up to. So to kind of get at that measured visualization question, this is just an example of how we think. Um, we try to find ways to connect the words of a planning document to the pictures of what the community might look like to the numbers, which might be more revealing of the way it might perform. And so what we've been doing over the years is building up uh, a quite a robust set of land use cases that are measured and illustrated exactly the same way. And so what we're doing with Revelstoke uh, right now, literally, is that we've gone through the form-based code that uh, John just described, and we've begun to link some of those diagrams on the left with uh, actual building types. So we've begun to uh, kind of identify buildings that meet these code requirements. And then in parallel, what we're doing is doing some energy modeling on them to get an understanding of what some of the combinations of construction standards and design standards and uh, energy options uh, what kind of outcome they might have in terms of energy intensity or emissions intensity. Um, in parallel with that, we've been building a fairly big digital model of Revelstoke, um, of which I'm showing you just a couple of snapshots here. Um, and so the idea here is that we're going to identify some neighborhood scale study areas uh, in the community, and we're going to uh, put that uh, um, those cases, those building blocks, if you will, into different kinds of combinations to demonstrate kind of A, what they look like, and B, how they might perform. And so uh, to kind of back up on the energy and emissions piece of this, so the, so the idea here is we're, we're using the 2007 inventory, uh, and we know pretty well uh, how much energy is going into the community, which is that described on the left. And what we don't know quite as well is how that energy is spent, how much of it goes into household scale choices, how much of it goes into neighborhood scale choices, and how much of it kind of scales up to a whole community uh, choices. So our aspirations here are to take that 
community-wide snapshot and actually start to tie it to those different scales. And the one that will be the biggest challenge for us is the middle one, which we think a lot of the land use planning needs to play out at a neighborhood scale and connecting the kind of energy consequences of planning decisions to vehicle miles traveled and, and building energy intensity is, is an area that we anticipate spending a lot of our uh, energy and effort on. And so the way we're going to go about this is uh, very soon, in a few months, May 2012, we're going to do a workshop with the community in which we uh, have them engage without any sense of measurement of the energy implications, what some of these options for uh, two study areas in the community are. So we're going to do these visualization exercises, and out of that will come, here's some ways that the community might grow in the future uh, relative to the community plan and the form-based code. After that's done, we're going to measure the energy and emissions consequences of them and get some kind of an overview of uh, if people grew the community in ways that they would like to, what would the outcome be relative to uh, the emissions goal and to energy consequences. And then we're going to ask them to revisit the uh, futures that they had described and see if anything about what they learned about the energy and emissions consequences affected the way uh, they thought about this. So we hope to learn and to communicate back to PICS and to any other community uh, in the world, actually, but particularly in D.C., is uh, will this way of working using measured visualizations elevate uh, the, the role of energy and emissions in local planning conversations? And would that elevated awareness improve receptivity or perception of planning strategies that improve energy and emissions performance? And of course, which of the techniques that we use to measure and visualize turned out to be the most effective and practical. So that's the work in progress that we are. This is our contact information. Uh, uh, John's reference to the uh, uh, Unified Development Bylaw website is there. There's my email address and the uh, case-based data where all the uh, cases that we use are uh, at that particular website as well. So thank you. Very much, Ron. And uh, so now we would like to uh, turn things over to a, a discussion portion of, of today's presentation. And uh, um, so I would like to point you to the top right corner of your screen, that feedback button once once again. Um, if you do have a question, please just uh, um, click on that scroll down menu and change the indicator from green, which is proceed to question, and they will queue up for us. We will ask you to unmute your line and direct your question to um, who you think is most appropriate, um, or we may just more generally ask, uh, answer your question. You're also welcome to, if you don't want to wish to actually speak to the question, um, just type it into the Q&A uh, section at the top as well. And we do have a question there right now, which uh, perhaps Ted would like to speak to. Um, the question is, if the majority of GHGs are from transportation, have you considered a multi-stakeholder group? which includes agencies that address societal change to more active transportation. Hey, well, thanks for that. And hi, Pam. Hope oh, all is well with you in Kelowna. Um, thanks for your question, uh, Ted here. The, um, yeah, it, that's very, very provocative. I was initially looking at it from a, uh, looking at your question, assuming that you were coming at it from a, a regional district or a municipality perspective and bringing all the relevant stakeholders around those tab that table. And, uh, and it, as uh, I'm a little out of date on the uh, Central, uh, Central Okanagan Regional District and some of the transit plans and the like uh, that I recall them, uh, them developing uh, uh, at least in the past and bringing multi multiplicity of um, stakeholders around that table. I'm thinking as well, you know, Capital Regional District and their linkages in their transportation plan to the, what used to be called the Regional Growth Strategy and now is being called the Regional Sustainability Strategy and the related member municipalities thinking about TransLink and Metro Vancouver and, uh, you know, progressive trans transportation uh, initiatives, uh, every, you know, everything from, from uh, the, the walkable communities focus, the livable centers, the, the, uh, uh, the, transit, the transit implications and multimodal um, intersects uh, and the like, and there's lots of examples, other examples uh, around the province. As far as looking at it from a provincial perspective, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good one. Uh, not to my BC Transit, working with Ministry of Transportation and looking at the broad 40-year transportation plan. Um, not as 
far as uh, as far as specifically looking at it from a, uh, a a greenhouse gas emissions reductions perspective, that and I'm certainly not necessarily one that would be uh, fully in that loop. But I uh, I like that uh, suggestion. Would love to follow up with you on that. And uh, following this call, I'm going to query one of my uh, value contacts in the Ministry of Transportation and ask him that very question. So hopefully that, uh, that, that that's a bit of a segue time for that. I, I was also going to just step back if I can, and I was just r ruminating here in the past, thinking uh, that with our valued uh, rural communities around the province, I'll, I'll, if you take if, if while you think of a question or, or two in either the first question, which is uh, any questions from our attendees on any one of those bulleted issues that uh, our uh, speakers have uh, have touched on, and or uh, point number two, uh, similarly any examples you'd like to bring to the floor from your uh, your own community. Uh, and or three, for everybody, including our speakers, give some thought to maybe expanding on or touching on uh, anything you may have referenced, speakers, uh, regarding uh, facilitating economic development, because we know so, there's so much between uh, climate action and, uh, and prudent, sustainable, sustainable development. Uh, uh, what, John, your reference to Calgary and the $12 billion certainly jumps to mind on that one, so maybe give some thought to that. But just real quick, retrospectively, I was just ruminating over you know, the early 90s and, and the 20% club out of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Uh, we've been blessed in BC by having front runner leading, leading uh, municipalities and regional districts uh, uh, relative to so many other parts of Canada and, and, and the world in their own right. Since 2007, so many innovative approaches that have been undertaken that we've heard uh, our three speakers speak to here. Uh, are, if, if you will, uh, not only innovative, but they're, they're, they're pushing forward on so many, so many different fronts and speak uh, in part to uh, the, the silent majority of uh, communities out there that are making their own progress on, uh, on SAME. So we're certainly proud of, uh, of, we, the Royal We, are certainly proud of all of you. Uh, I think there's 61 plus members of the FCM Partners in Climate Protection Program that are BC municipalities that we work, uh, work with on, uh, on uh, supporting common communication and frameworks and uh, and the like. So um, uh, just kudos to, uh, kudos to you guys. Ted, if I could jump in here, John, John Gunther here. One of the things that we did on the economic development side that we saw important, especially as development proceeds, is the view that uh, people need to have a fairly good feel of what their future uh, community looks like. Uh, and that includes active transportation. And in, in order to integrate that, one of the ideas was to do proactive planning, and that is to do development planning. I realize that takes resources, but the idea is that we would work with uh, developers or building owners or people that wanted to change things proactively to give them a context, to not just do a lot-by-lot lot kind of thing, but put it into a broader framework. The more that you can do that in a municipality, the more the predictability around economic development it takes hold. Uh, and that is that you have a share of the development land use component that includes industrial, commercial, mixed use, some obviously residential and some single family. And that you're, you're, you've got, first of all, those potentials that exist so people can come in and capitalize on them. Uh, and the field is ripe for people to use it. If it's not there, if it's not known, and if it's not understood well, then we're, you're reacting, and that's, that tends to be the way democracies do planning. They react to things. They don't plan for them. We see this in our urban fabric all over and our rural fabric all over the, the province. Ron might want to add something to that, or I guess that. That's all I had for it. <laughs> Thanks very much, John. Ron, did you have something to add to that? Uh, no, I, that's good. Okay. Um, would like to turn to just a, a few other people who uh, seem to be keen to to put forward some questions here. And before I do that, I had promised um, at this point to mention that we do have uh, resources and contacts on the next two slides. So if you are having to drop out before the end, um, please be aware that those are will be available. Um, but next on the queue is uh, Larry Plord. And uh, you may have been there for some time just from that test we did at the start. But if you do have a question, um, please go ahead. Hit star six and you can ask your question. Okay, I, I do think that may have been a holdover. So, and Pam, we did uh, we did hear from you with your question. So perhaps, uh, unless you have anything more, um, 
We'll turn to Mary Ann Stoltz, and I see you've, uh, yeah, you've answered your question in multiple ways. So, Mary Ann, please, star six, and go ahead. I apologize. I'm not familiar with the webinar system, so I wasn't sure if I was asking the right uh, way. Anyways, what my question is, I, I, and I guess it's more for Ron, um, has there been any specific modeling done for agricultural land use development specifically? Right. Sorry. Ron, Ron yeah, you have your line uh, muted? Oh, we just couldn't hear you there. We're up now. We, okay. We um, so, Marianne, I'm not sure what modeling of uh, energy and emissions or modeling of agricultural production or... Well, it just it, it intrigues me um, on how you've established a, a method of, of education um, for public interface, and uh, I was just wondering if, if any type of land use development specific to agriculture um, it, within the urban interface has been considered as part of, of that. Uh, work that you're in process of I'll, I'll right I now? Word, so, not in our research lives, but um, I have students who have been doing things like this quite a bit. And uh, so there, so in that regard, there are some kind of uh, emerging studies, but none of them have been taken out into the field quite yet, uh, actually. There was a grad student who worked with me about a year ago who uh, kind of looked at the, uh, that exact question, is the flow of energy through agricultural landscapes. So. If you'd like to follow up and talk to me about it later, I'd be happy to do that. That would be wonderful. I'll definitely be in contact with you then, Ron. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thanks very much, Ron. And we, we do, and we have a, an opening here for any additional questions that anyone does have. Hi, it's uh, Pam again calling from um, dialing in from Kelowna. Um, I just, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Go ahead. Oh, wonderful. Part of my question with um, stakeholders group was really alluding to the fact that the latest research says that by 2030, one in three of us will have diabetes. And, uh, of course, we're an aging population. So that will, I think, in heavily in select, in, uh, impact on planning and how our towns will in the next 50 years look like with the demographics shifting to those with chronic diseases, less mobility, um, very unlikely to be driving. Uh, they will be driving less just because of their lack of mobility. So I'm just wondering whether or not that, that has been um, taken into any of the modeling. <clears throat> Dale here. Um, I, I can say that uh, we do include some of that in some of the seed quick start uh, modeling, recognizing that there is a natural decrease in vehicle kilometers traveled as people age, uh, and that's more of a consideration in some communities than others, uh, particularly some in the southern uh, parts of the Okanagan and uh, some over on Vancouver Island where there's a very significant uh, senior, <coughs> seniors population. Uh, we also are encouraging the local governments to connect with the health authorities on a variety of issues, not, not just the promotion of active transportation and health outcomes associated with that, but also on leveraging where it's, uh, where it's provided um, the transportation services that uh, the health authorities sometimes provide. It's kind of the undocumented uh, or stealth uh, intercommunity uh, transportation. That's uh, that's all that exists out there. And uh, go ahead, you uh, I, I can I can jump in on that as well. Um, it, I, I think that there's a well. I suspect that there's a very strong relationship between a community that has low greenhouse gas emissions and a community that has um, higher health health outcomes. And um, I think it's a big question that needs to be looked at a lot. And at least we're, we're hoping to, to look at that question and, and build some sort of model that will evaluate the greenhouse gas emissions as, as associated with land use as well as the health outcomes associated with land use. Yeah, people, Sorry, Ron, go ahead. I was just going to suggest that if people don't know the work of Larry Frank uh, at UBC, the Center for Active Transport, he's done a fair bit of... Uh, energy, well, more GHG modeling relative to uh, health outcomes, and that's the nature of his work is to connect the dots on those two things. 
So Larry Frank, Center for Active Transportation. Yeah, and Larry does have actually a lot of information, but it's usually a higher urban density than a lot of our, than a lot of our communities um, outside of the lower main, mainland half. Uh, agreed. Yeah, and agreed, Pam, and, and, and Ron, that's a wonderful little segue. If I can take you back on these uh, comments as well, uh, you know, I'll be talking a lot about uh, co-benefits and, and from health, um, looking at, uh, at complementary uh, uh, efforts that will also have health, health incomes like, uh, health outcomes like, um, you know, uh, walkable communities. Uh, for example, we have a lot of the work that uh, Ron mentioned that Dr. Larry Frank uh, undertakes, uh, notwithstanding the larger communities that he uh, has typically been looking at, but complete compact energy efficient uh, communities just to use our, our nomenclature from the Climate Action Charter, you end up, you, you're focusing towards more compact, complete communities so they're more walkable uh, pedestrian friendly communities. They're also, there's the social element of social interaction, uh, uh, uh from, from that. There's a reduction of, um, or, or improvements in air quality that are concomitant uh, with that as well that has its own set of, uh, Sidewalk. of, of air quality, uh, uh air quality. Yeah, going up? Yeah. Oh. yeah, like to, like to cover the whole downtown area to fill in the gaps. Yeah. And well, it had estimates. We have, for have a conversation going on there. That's, that, that may be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. And then the only other comment. Okay, I or do you want, like, I'll be back again Tuesday? I'm okay. sorry. We do have uh, some. I can go again. It only takes me minutes. Yeah, I'm just uh, put this on lecture mode. The, girls will be the conference is in lecture mode. And, and just the only other comment to make is just recently we've been talking with some, uh, some other indicator gurus, and I'll list a couple of them. Uh, and, and leading this one up has volunteered to be the Whisper Center for Sustainability, who've been working with a number of uh, local governments around BC as well on their integrated community sustainability, sustainable planning quick start uh, program. But talking uh, talking with them and other colleagues like Fraser Basin Council's uh, indicator gurus, Steve Litsky and, and Metro Vancouver, and a couple within the provincial government and a couple of others, recently just looking at looking at this cadre of of, of indicators, sustainability indicators that we might look at as common metrics for local governments in uh, in, in BC. So that's just an aside, and nothing. Uh, it, this, that discussion's only just started, uh, Pam. But uh, certainly keeping health outcomes. Uh, although I'm furthest from understanding sort of direct cause and effect relationships of, as it pertains to health, but uh, certainly uh, the importance of health outcomes as far as the. Uh, Health of the communities that will be living uh, uh, living together in a sustainable way is so uh, is so important. Thanks, Ted. And I, I would ask uh, our attendees to please mute their lines at star six at this time, uh, unless you do have a question here. I will take it out of lecture mode now, and hopefully that uh, that conversation has ended. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Did a repair job on last summer. We have hoping to replace it. We are hoping to get money from the club. I'm going to go back onto lecture mode. The, guys mode here the conference and, is in lecture uh, mode. I may have to ask you to do, unfortunately, at this point, is actually type in your questions in the, the Q&A at, uh, at the top, and I'm sorry for these technical challenges. Okay. Um, yeah, just, uh, I know we're running short on time, folks, but a couple things. Uh, one, just a, a segue of, of so many innovative things going forward. Ron, you were the last speaker, and I think that so eloquently speaks to... Uh, the value of bringing pictures to the table, right? Bringing maps and 3Ds, et cetera, adding, adding what has been kind of more to date than words and numbers. And as you, one of your slides says, adding the, uh, the visual side of that, because, uh, some of us, half of our brain, I guess, is more visually oriented than, uh, than, uh, than the other half. Uh, the other comment, if I can, and I'm not too sure if Bill is able to, uh, respond to this, but I know, uh, I, I see a couple people that are on our invitee list that have similar uh, interests, and that's on the topic of district energy systems. Bill, Bill spoke briefly about, uh, I think it was hospital-based, uh, looking at a system that could potentially be tied, uh, building a hospital tied in with the commercial center and maybe even uh, some of the surrounding uh, residential areas. Um, curious, uh, 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 Bill, possibly a question to yourself or anybody else that has similar experience in rural communities. I'm thinking, of course, uh, Revelstoke, obviously, uh, uh, John and uh, and Alan, you're ruminating, you're, you're you're thinking on that, and uh, an Enderby small little district energy system, etc., is the challenge of scale when it comes to district energy systems in, in rural communities. But it's exciting to see so many uh, 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 
communities like yourself on the phone here are starting to, uh, starting or have for some time now been leaders on that front. Just wondering if there's any comments on things. Just going to, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that that, uh, that conversation has uh, has finished. So again, please, if the audience could be mute their line, and uh, hopefully we can hear from Bill as well. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Hi, Bill, are, are you there? Did you want to speak yeah. with us? Yeah, I'm here, Ted. Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. It, it's a it's a recent uh, opportunity, I think, comes for the Village of Queen Charlotte, and tied very much to the plans for a $50 million dollar upgrade or new, actually new hospital, which is immediately adjacent to our commercial area, our major commercial area. Uh, we have a new economic development officer in the community, Heather Hornoy, um, who started here earlier this year. I don't remember her name now. This is one of the projects she brought forward. Yeah. Um, Whoop. Sorry, Bill. And again, um, audience, in, right? if you could please mute your line, star six. We are getting a conversation that is interrupting our, our, uh, our webinar. Please, Bill, if you could go ahead. Yeah, did you hear me what I said? Or I think you, you had a contact name there we didn't quite catch. Okay, yeah, the uh, the economic development officer in town here is Heather Hornoy, and she came to us earlier this year from Kimberly, and uh, she's the one who's kind of, I, th I think, identified the opportunity uh, for this community energy uh, project uh, to tie in with plans for building a new hospital. So I would say we're probably somewhere in the... Um, uh, three-year period of uh, looking at that, uh, depending upon hospital funding. But I'm very interested in seeing the plan, uh, seeing what Revelstoke has done there, and uh, we'll refer her to that. Wonderful. Jo Thank you, uh, Bill. John, just any any uh, any thoughts on things? Any any lessons learned for uh, other rural communities? Yeah, you know, we, uh, we've got three elements of ours. We did the Community Energy and Emissions Plan. We have a District Energy and Expansion Plan. We call it the SEEP and the DEEP. Uh, both of those are public documents. We can certainly, and I think they're on the list of documents you have here available, Ted. Uh, the other one is a business plan, actually, which is part of putting together uh, three or four components of how the corporation operates, what its governance is like, uh, potential service area bylaws, which is the idea of putting in, in the zoning bylaw mandatory hookups, as well as energy-ready design for buildings. And that is, if buildings are going to be designed to be hydronic or hot water, they need to be thought of and, and regulated at some stage in the, in the design process. Those are really fundamentals, we believe, uh, for a valid and really strong and robust community energy system. We're at capacity right now. We just hooked up. Uh, we should have people come and tour uh, Revelstoke soon too. We just hooked up our new high school, which is Lead Gold, uh, and it was hooked up before, but the new one's hooked up, and the new elementary school will be hooked up next uh, summer. So uh, we're looking for capacity expansion. Uh, there's also provisions in the new biomass boiler thing for an on for off monitoring without hiring a power engineer. That legislation was international legislation changed within the last year as well. That helps with putting the systems in place. We have a we have a, a really good volunteer uh, resource there with David Johnson and Jeff Battersby. Um, Jeff is the former mayor. So uh, if any community wants to, a contact, a good contact, we have lots of those there and a fairly good track record of how to respond to these types of needs within the community, especially uh, as demand ramps up or as you want to start building demand. Hopefully that helps. Thanks very much, John, and I think we, we are getting very close to the end of the time. It's just a minute left, but there was one last question here, um, which I, I, I'll read out. Um, I'm sorry we won't have much time for it, but um, and this is a question that comes from Kelly Gresner. Um, all of our work is in rural communities on Vancouver Island for regional district clients. We are writing GHD reduction targets, policies, and actions into OCPs. How will these regional districts manage to monitor success? or lack thereof toward the target. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Kelly. We may have to follow this up online. That's a value. That's an information-laden uh, question, and I'll just touch on it right now, but I'd love to follow up with you afterwards. Let me touch on uh, uh, the, the corporate side, and I think we'll see me be on the line here, a colleague over with Climate Action Secretariat, and uh, they, with the Green Communities Committee, uh, are working on carbon neutral um, uh, a carbon neutral framework to guide local governments as well as specifically a smart tool uh, to, to, uh, to work with uh, interested local governments on developing a framework to then subsequently monitor going forward. So as far as local government operations are concerned, uh, that is kind of the tool 
uh, and or there are other, other tools out there, but that's kind of the key tool that is provided uh, uh, thanks to uh, earlier work with uh, ministries in the province and uh, public sector organizations. As far as uh, the GHG reduction targets, policies, and actions more broadly, uh, on a community-wide basis, that's where uh, we can speak at length, of course, Kelly, offline, and regarding the uh, BC's community energy and emission inventories for all local governments in BC, first in North America, as a base to uh, provide as a baseline measure, which is 2007, 2010s will be coming up early next year, and then 2012 and every two years. Uh, hence, there are supporting indicators that we're developing uh, and, 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 and furthering uh, going forward on that. So the CEI is make, it will be making this transition from being a baseline measure to an ongoing monitoring reporting measure, hopefully at the crux of, uh, of other supplementary information and related data that uh, can complement that for each and every municipality and or regional district in the province. If I'm not mistaken, it's an upcoming webinar as well, the uh, CEI, is it not, in February? Uh, yep. Is that the date? Yeah, it could be coming up. And, uh, yep. Okay. Um, great. Thanks very much. So now I'd like, we'd, uh, like to close out for the day. So thank you very much. Thank you all to our, our presenters and attendees. As promised, we did have um, some contacts, and uh, would you like to run through these? Yeah, I just, I just like to say sincerely, bless you all, speakers. Uh, we look at the time, and uh, off, we're, we're providing so much information in a relatively short period of time. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. And, and as such, the community presenters that were on the line, you see this slide with Ellen, Bill, and John is coordinates are there, and of course it's going to be uh, recorded and uh, posted on, on this site uh, uh, going forward. So thank you again for that. There are complimentary uh, 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 practitioners. Next slide is the three from Dale, Yule, and Ron. And again, thank you for uh, supporting those communities with uh, the, uh, the progressive, innovative work that you're doing. And my, my contact on the bottom there. And the last slide, very briefly, again, it'll be uh, it'll be uh, is the uh, is the uh, uh, sites that uh, some sites that are established that you may visit on a regular basis. Uh, but if you don't already, I encourage you to go to the Green Communities uh, website uh, hosted by the Minister of Community uh, Sport and Cultural Development and just posted last week are the 2010 tariff reports. Those are the reports that every local government has been, uh, or majority of local governments have, have uh, submitted on uh, progress they're making both at a corporate and community-wide level on uh, working towards uh, their targets, uh, greenhouse gas emission targets, the Climate Action Toolkit, Again, familiar, uh, oh, trustfully a familiar site for everybody. The funding subtag there has two funding guides. One is one that Dale here on the line uh, through the Community Energy Association has updated recently, another one with specific info. The third and fourth bullet points with the Hydro Quick Start website that Dale referred to, Sustainability Solutions Group, Group's uh, GHG Proof website that, uh, that Yule has, uh, has spoken to and is on their uh, on their site as for the as for the address uh, below and the action guides and other materials similar to Dale has put has put down and I will mention that there are other practitioners out there a couple may be on the phone uh, right now but the modeling the modeling uh, state of the art if you will continues to be pushed by these uh, these kind of pioneers in this uh, in this area and we're holding a uh, practitioners modeling practitioners workshop with Ron uh, on the phone here at UBC next week. Stay tuned for the 2010 CEI reports that Darby mentioned. Again, on the toolkit site, we'll give you a, uh, a, a freeway pass or a bridge pass over to the Ministry of Environment's uh, CEI reports uh, site. Modeling inventory of tools I mentioned, and we, we will be updating uh, that site uh, following the, uh, the practitioner's workshop and a mod an inventory of tools uh, matrix for all those. And the last point to make is the Green Municipal Funds. You may know, but starting December the 1st, next week, they will be opening applications for a range of uh, plans, feasibility studies, field tests, capital projects, uh, going into, I believe it's 2012, 2013 years. So on that. And go to that, uh, that website as, uh, as you can. Thank you again, everybody. Thanks very much. Uh, just uh, just the very last thing, uh, I would just like to point you back to the handout section, as, as John mentioned, and as was mentioned off the top, there are some documents for you there. Um, we will be putting out a survey a couple of days uh, after the webinar, and I just strongly encourage you to please fill that in. Your feedback helps us tremendously, and it will certainly help future webinars. 
And uh, that is it. We, I, I will be sending out an email to all of uh, the registrants, uh, you attendees, um, once the recording is up on the, the website. And I would certainly ask you to forward that out further to uh, to any any people that you feel would be interested in that. So finally, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you to the attendees. Thanks to our presenters. Thanks, Darby. Thanks, Paige. Bye-bye. Thanks, Darby. Thanks a lot.